Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we start a new series on waste. It's going to be a short one, about three videos. First topic for the day is going to be the generation of waste and the three R's. So, as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the components of municipal solid waste and discuss each of the three R's. So, Let's talk a little bit about this idea of waste just in general. As we've talked about all year long, every system has inputs and outputs. So when we're talking about the waste stream, here's what we got. Your input is raw material and energy. These raw materials and energy go into the system. They are used in the system. They cycle in the system. Once they become useless, they are output from the system. Now, the outputs of our system is going to be waste energy, so this is going to be heat and noise and all of those energies that are wasted, and then materials that can be recycled or disposed of. So once you are done with something, you throw it in the trash and it's sent away. Now, for most of the living world, animals and plants, their inputs go through the cycle and their outputs are usually used by another organism. So, I don't know, elephant eats some grass, grass stays in the body, elephant poops, the poop is broken down by bugs and detritivores and fungus and bacteria, etc. So in most of the natural world, the outputs are actually reused. However, humans, we produce waste that no other animal can use. We take oil, we build it into a plastic bottle. Plastic bottle? Nobody can do anything with that. So we are the only species on Earth that creates outputs that can't actually be used by other organisms. So our outputs become our solid waste stream, which is going to be the topic for a good chunk of this video. We have to talk about a shift in society from a society that reused things to a throwaway society. So pre-World War II, most of the way things were done around the world is once an item was manufactured, if it broke, it got fixed, or if it got broke beyond fixable, you found something else to do with it. So you start out with a bookcase. Let's say a shelf on the bookcase gets broken. You take the wood from that bookcase and you build a stool. Stool gets broken, you burn the wood for heat. You have used that thing all the way through until you can't use it anymore. The idea was to keep things around as long as possible. After World War II, we had growing families, we had machinery, we had industrialization, we had the ability to produce things cheaply that could be used and thrown away, so we moved to a throwaway society where you had meals coming packaged ready to go in the microwave and then plastic to throw away, you had plastic containers around everything, you had planned obsolescence, which is the idea that objects were built with the intent that they would no longer be useful in a year or two or three. So obviously it's good for companies because it keeps their business base up. We see this all the time with cell phones. Apple puts out an iPhone, six or eight months later they come out with a new one. That's planned obsolescence. So recognize the shift from using and reusing things to planned obsolescence in a throwaway society. Obviously it's going to generate more waste. Which leads us to the municipal solid waste stream. It's going to be abbreviated as MSW through the rest of our videos. And this is all the stuff that cannot be reused. It's tossed out. Roughly 60% of municipal solid waste is residential, so that would be the home. 40% is institutional, so that's going to be from companies and factories and government and things like that. If you were to break it down, about 4.5 pounds of waste is generated per person per day in the U.S., but obviously this is going to vary by location. If you go to the developing world, their output might be less than a pound of municipal solid waste a day. Some countries in the world are close to 5 pounds of municipal solid waste per person per day. So just like everything else, your environmental impact is going to be largely based on where you live. With the waste stream, you need to know that it is the flow of solid waste that is recycled, incinerated, placed in a landfill, or disposed of otherwise. So there's going to be all of those waste inputs that have to be dealt with somehow. And if we're going to take this waste stream and break it down into its major components, here's roughly how the waste stream breaks down. Right here is the waste stream by composition. So you got wood, yard trimmings, food scraps, paper. All of this stuff right here is organic material, which means it's potentially compostable, and I'll talk about composting later on. All of this stuff here, right here, is potentially compost. So that is going to be a large proportion, 31, 44, 
57, about 64%, 65% of our municipal, municipal solid waste is potentially compostable. Then you got 8% as rubber and textiles, plastics, 12%, that would be recyclable stuff right there. Metals, 8% also recyclable. Glass, 5% also recyclable. So if you look at our waste stream right here, almost all of it is potentially recyclable and compostable. I'll get to that later on. If you talk about by source, non-durable goods are things that aren't meant to last long, so there's going to be paper products, things like that. Durable goods, 18%. These are things that are meant to last, like mixers and phones, stuff like that. You see here, the largest component or the largest source of our waste stream is going to be containers and packaging, making up 30%. So obviously, that's a place we could reduce some waste right there. And then food and yard waste, 26%. This would be stuff that is compostable. So make sure that you look through these and are able to discuss uh, the waste stream by composition and the waste stream by source. As we talk about waste, one of the biggest things we need to talk about is e-waste. This is a problem that obviously has just come on the scene in the last 50 years ago. Problem with e-waste, particularly old e-waste, so those big heavy computer monitors, big heavy TVs, things like that, is they're filled with toxic heavy metals, lead, arsenic, cadmium, things like that. They are expensive to recycle because they are filled with toxic materials and they are not yet really regulated in, in most cases. It's cheaper to throw old electronics out into a landfill rather than to have them properly recycled. Um, and even when they are recycled, a lot of times in America, we take those things and we ship them to other countries because we don't want to deal with the recycling process. So e-waste is a big deal because it's filled with toxic metals. It's hard to recycle. It's usually unsafe to recycle if not done properly. If you've got a person breaking down one of these things, they can be poisoned or electrocuted from the stuff that's inside. So recognize that e-waste is a really big deal needs to be dealt with properly and obviously as our society moves more electronic it's going to become an even bigger problem. So all of this talk about the waste stream should be leading you to the idea of well if we've got all this stuff that's recyclable, compostable, whatever, how can we reduce all this stuff that's going to landfills because obviously the stuff we produce it doesn't go away. There is no way. Everything you throw away has to go somewhere. So it could pile up in a landfill it could be tossed out by the side of the road. If it's left out in nature, it's going to break down and release its chemicals out into nature, or it's going to take up space, or it's going to re uh, like break down and give off methane. So waste must be dealt, dealt with. The best way to do this is through the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and then I'm going to throw compost on the end of that. We're going to talk through those, and that'll be the end of our day. So the first and most practical way to reduce municipal solid waste is uh, the R of reduce. This is the big one. Source reduction is to reduce the amount of material used in the production of something. If you put fewer inputs into the system, you get fewer outputs out of the system. So if we can use less stuff, then we produce less waste. A really good example of this is Subaru. The car manufacturer has a plant in America here that is a zero waste facility. Um, historically speaking, building cars produces a ton and tons and tons of wastes and chemicals and things like that. Subaru has built a plant that produces no waste. So from that plant, everything is recycled or reused. Nothing goes to a landfill. So that would be an example of source reduction. Easier to think of uh, example of source reduction would be to reduce the amount of packaging on a product. If there's less packaging on the product to start with, that's less packaging to go into the landfill. And as we saw in one of our diagrams, packaging is like 30% of the waste stream. So reduce is the first and the most important. If you cannot reduce it and something ends up into the waste stream, then you want to increase the residence time. The residence time is the useful life of a product before it is thrown away. So reuse would be the idea of continually using something and reusing and repurposing it before it actually throw, is thrown away. As you can see right there, you can make jewelry. I would say that there is a really big movement at the moment towards reuse, whether it is vintage stuff becoming cool and being recycled and refurbished to go in houses, or the maker movement that is looking at how can we take scraps of things and repurpose them into something useful. You got Etsy, which is built upon people repurposing stuff into art and jewelry and furniture. So I think people are starting to really grasp on the reuse idea. So that's something that's probably going to become increasingly popular over time. And then as a very last resort, we've got recycling. This is the last resort because it doesn't keep things in the waste stream or it doesn't keep things in the system. It is still 
taking an output and it still involves the input of materials because you have to make things so it is a last resort there's closed loop recycling and open loop recycling and closed root closed loop recycling the material is recycled to make the same thing again so a really good example of this would be a soda can take that soda can which is made of aluminum you recycle it you make more soda cans that would be closed loop recycling because it doesn't require the input of more aluminum you can keep making soda cans from the old soda cans without having to go mine more aluminum open loop recycling is where you would say take oil to make a plastic bottle that plastic bottle gets recycled to make the fleece for a fleece jacket in this case you have still got an input and output so you're gonna have to still use oil to make more plastic bottles but you're at least increasing the residence time of that oil and taking it from a plastic bottle into a fleece jacket so recycle is the last option but it's still an option and I want to finish off with composting because as I showed on one of our diagrams earlier something like 65 percent of the material that goes into a landfill is compostable and we've talked about uh, organic materials when they're stuck in anaerobic conditions as you would find in a landfill they break down to produce methane which is a really harmful greenhouse gas we've talked about this already so composting is taking organic materials and helping them to break down under conditions that promote proper breakdown. So these conditions are aerobic, there's air around proper moisture. When organic materials are allowed to break down properly, they produce compost, which is a very nutrient-rich organic material that can be used to enrich soil as a fertilizer. Um, so if you take these organic materials and you allow them to break down properly, they actually become useful material at the end rather than breaking down to produce methane which increases global warming. Now at home, you can compost, saving your food scraps and putting those outside. Now, when you are composting, there's a couple things to keep in mind. You have to have a proper mix between carbon and nitrogen, or an easier way to say this is between green waste and brown waste. You need to have lots of green waste that would be like food scraps and yard clippings with some brown waste, which would be like dead leaves and paper and things like that. Some cities are starting pretty intense composting uh, programs because they realize that one they can reduce the amount of stuff they're having to truck to the landfill and two if they produce compost on a large scale they can actually sell that to farmers and gardeners and things like that city of san francisco i believe has actually made it illegal to throw away compostable goods so when people in san francisco throw their trash out rather than having like a trash bin and a recycling bin they've got a trash bin a compost bin and a recycling bin so it is a good way to deal with organic waste and if we could compost everything, that would reduce our waste stream by something like 65%. So that's what we got for the day. Municipal solid waste, three R's in composting. Hope you found this helpful. My name is Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast. Hopefully we'll see you again.